from the city that never sleeps. 17 miles from Madison Square Garden, New York City. It's America at Night with Rich Valdez, America's favorite late night talk program, featuring interesting guests from around the world and calls from across America. And now, here is your host, Rich Valdez. Hi there, good evening, and what's up, America? I am Rich Valdez, Valdez with an S, at Rich Valdez on all of the social media. Your liberty-loving Latino amigo, happy to be here with you this Thursday evening. It is the 80th anniversary of D-Day tonight, and uh, if you want to join us, give us a call, 833-482-5337, 833-4-VALDEZ. And, of course, uh, I always take a page out of the playbook of one of my mentors, the great one, Mark Levin, and give you a little historical context, you know, some older um, speeches, some clips of speeches from back in the days of maybe President Reagan, President Trump. Um, and we have probably a little President Biden, too, uh, commemorating D-Day. But I think he skipped it a couple of years ago. This year, he's actually in France. <clears throat> but the um, we're going to get into that in a minute. I love to set the stage with a little bit of um, what what D-Day is all about and why we're we're doing what we do. And we have a clip from the History Channel that I want you to hear. A little bit long, but worth it. Check it out. Well, D-Day was a, obviously the most important single fight of that war. And, of course, had we lost it, there's no telling what the outcome would have been. Since the American entry into the war, American generals had been agitating for an opportunity to fight the Germans directly. The D-Day invasion, invasion of Normandy in June 1944, represented the cutting edge of this offensive. The essential condition that underwrote the success of D-Day was the fact that Germany had been bled virtually to death by fighting on the Eastern Front uh, for several years against the Red Army and the Soviet Union. And as these brave men and women, um, not women, back in that time it was all men, uh, the brave women were back home doing, you know, the Rosie the Riveter stuff. But as these brave men got off of these um, amphibious type vehicles, you know, the, the front opens up of these boats and they, they start marching, wading through the water and like knee high water to get onto the shore uh, on the beaches of Normandy. It's just quite a scene. And years ago, I remember I interviewed a, a colleague of mine whose dad uh, was there in Normandy and had shared not all of it because most of those guys that served didn't like to talk about their service, but shared a lot with his children. And his son, who was, uh, again, a colleague of mine, uh, shared a lot of it with me. And it was so eye-opening. It was so enriching, honestly, for me to to hear the the account from somebody, you know, who got it firsthand, you know, or at least from his, his own dad. It wasn't somebody he knew or a media interview. It was, you know, the, the scoop directly from the source. And and it, it left a, quite an impression on me. I also had an opportunity uh, a couple of years back to interview a, a World War II veteran, uh, who um, fighter pilot who flew uh, the uh, one of these bombardier um, planes. And again, just what an opportunity, right? A real blessing to me. And there's a number of good speeches that I want to play for you and not enough time to play them all, but I want you to hear a little bit of Joe El Baboso Biden at the 80th uh, D-Day anniversary commemoration ceremony in Normandy, France today. Listen to this. Now the question for us is, in our hour of trial, will we do ours? We're living in a time when democracy is more at risk across the world than any point since the end of World War II, since these beaches were stormed in 1944. Now we have to ask ourselves, Will we stand against tyranny, against evil, against crushing brutality of the iron fist? Will we stand for freedom? Will we defend democracy? Will we stand together? My answer is yes and only can be yes. So that is Joe El Baboso Biden. And he went on to talk about NATO and, and the strength of NATO and the alliance of 32 countries, et cetera, et cetera. And it wasn't really uh, moving wasn't really something that 
for me. Uh, but again, I, I'm biased, right? I don't, I'm not really a fan of Joe El Baboso Biden's. But I got to say, you compare Joe Biden at the 80th D-Day an- anniversary uh, with Donaldus Magnus, El Trumpito, Donald J. Trump at the 75th D-Day commemoration. And I'll tell you, the, the two are incomparable. Listen to Trump. They battled not for control and domination, but for liberty, democracy, and self-rule. They pressed on for love and home and country, the main streets, the schoolyards, the churches, and neighbors, the families, and communities that gave us men such as these. They were sustained by the confidence that America can do anything because we are a noble nation with a virtuous people praying to a righteous God. The exceptional might came from a truly exceptional spirit. The abundance of courage came from an abundance of faith. The great deeds of an army came from the great depths of their love. As they confronted their fate, the Americans of the Allies placed themselves into the palm of God's hand. The men behind me will tell you that they are just the lucky ones. As one of them recently put it, all the heroes are buried here. But we know what these men did. We knew how brave they were. They came here and saved freedom. And then they went home and showed us all what freedom is all about. The American sons and daughters who saw us to victory were no less extraordinary in peace. They built families, they built industries, they built a national culture that inspired the entire world. In the decades that followed, America defeated communism, secured civil rights, revolutionized science, launched a man to the moon, and then kept on pushing to new frontiers. And today, America is stronger than ever before. And again, no comparison. And I would have played more of Biden, and we can play a little bit more of him later, if he had something really valid to say. I feel uh, Trump understands the sacrifice a lot better, even if it's a speechwriter. His speechwriter understands the difference more. Uh, Biden goes into talking about NATO and talking about the things that he's broken while he's been president, right? Uh, he hasn't done a heck of a good job with um, anything in, in, with regard to NATO, uh, destabilizing both uh, the European region and uh, not to mention the Middle East. So I, I, I look at this and I say, man, no comparison. It, it's, it's night and day. And that's exactly what this country is facing in 2024. It's a night and day comparison. Some people will say that one candidate is night. The others will say the other one is day. That'll be up to the voters to decide. But straight ahead, I want to play a a clip from Ed Berthold. Might be Berthold. I don't know. And he's 104 years old, uh, World War II veteran at the D-Day anniversary ceremony today. And he read a letter that he sent home the day after the invasion. That's coming up straight ahead, along with Lieutenant Dan. Don't go anywhere. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. best guests, the best opinions. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Wednesday night, June 7th, 1944. 
Dear Mom, just a few lines to tell you we are all okay. We flew mission number 10 on D-Day. It certainly was a terrific show, what we could see. This is what everyone has been waiting for. Now we can see the results of the bombing aid Air Force has been doing the past months. That is Ed Berthold, a 104-year-old veteran at the D-Day anniversary ceremony, reading a letter that he sent home uh, the day after the invasion. And again, quite remarkable. The guy sounds like a champ, 104 years old. He sounds better than me many nights. And uh, I'm just always enamored with these uh, these veterans of the World War II um, era because they're just remarkable men. They don't call them the greatest generation for nothing. And you look at that, and it just reminds you of so many things that go on in life. And we, we take so much for granted when it comes to veterans. And on this 80th anniversary of D-Day, I wanted to make sure that we spoke about veterans and those that are working on behalf of veterans. And uh, the first person that comes to mind for me is Lieutenant Dan. You know him better as Gary Sinise, a Hollywood actor turned advocate for veterans affairs because he was so impacted by the role he played in Forrest Gump. And Gary Sinise is our guest right now. Gary Sinise, welcome back, sir. Hey, thanks for having me, Rich. Good to you be bet. with you. Amen. So let's um, let's talk a little bit about what you've been up to, uh, because I know uh, the Gary Sinise Foundation, you guys are always busy, uh, not just this time of year, but all year. Oh, we have uh, multiple programs. Uh, since we're talking about D-Day and, and World War sure. II, uh, one of one of our programs, uh, so I started back in 2015 in partnership with the National World War II Museum in New Orleans, and also American Airlines. I have uh, veterans in my family. Um, that's where so much of my work begins. And two of those veterans are World War II veterans. My uncle Jerry served on a ship in the Pacific. He was about 18 years old. He was there for the invasions of Iwo Jima and Okinawa, and then uh, part of the occupation of Japan. Wow. Uh, when they surrendered. And then my Uncle Jack was a navigator on a B-17 bomber over Europe. And my Uncle Jerry, unfortunately, passed away in 1996, and he was living in Texas, so I didn't spend a lot of time with him. But I did spend a lot of time with my Uncle Jack, uh, talking to him about his experiences as a navigator, 30 missions over Europe. I took him down to the National World War II Museum. Uh, we recorded him on video there. And then after he passed away, I asked the museum to give me his video, and I watched it, and I, I was very moved. And so I called the museum up, and I said, you know, every family with a World War II veteran should have a record like this. Uh, can, can we help fund your historians to go out and record uh, our, our veterans on videotape? And so we started doing that, and then I uh, teamed up with American Airlines and asked them if they would um, as you know, provide the travel, uh, for us to take World War II veterans down to the National World War II Museum. We started doing that in, in 2015. We've since taken hundreds of World War II veterans down to the museum. Uh, just recently, May 31st, I, uh, with American Airlines, I, uh, spoke at the send-off ceremony for 68 World War II veterans going over to to uh, Normandy for the 80th anniversary, and my foundation is one of the lead sponsors. And we can never do enough to recognize what they did all those years ago. Uh, I mean, just imagine, just consider this. Today, yeah, today, 80 years ago, was, if not the most, one of the most important and significant days in the 20th century. If we had not succeeded in uh, pushing into France that day, mm -hmm. and the Germans had pushed us out, and we had been defeated there. And that invasion, which had over 1,100, uh, 11,000 uh, planes, 7,000 ships, uh, we, we had 160,000 Allied forces come onto the beach that day. If we had not succeeded there, the entire outcome of the war would have been completely different. It would have been it would have been many many months before we could mobilize again, 
to try it again, to, to break that Atlantic wall. So the significance of D-Day and the D-Day veterans and, and all those veterans who fought in World War II uh, cannot be underestimated uh, or, over, uh, or, or valued enough. It, it was uh, such a significant day for all of us. Folks, we're on with Gary Sinise, and, uh, of course, he's uh, in charge of the Gary Sinise Foundation, dedicating themselves to working with veterans mm-hmm. on a number of different programs. And, Gary Sinise, you mentioned that you guys had done some funding of, of veterans to get to the um, D-Day anniversary, and uh, I know that uh, there, were, there was at least one that didn't make it uh, on the way, um, went to be with the Lord. His name is Robert Al Persikitty. Uh, Fairport, New York, 102 years old, and um, on the ship, he uh, had a medical emergency. He was airlifted to a hospital in Germany, so I just wanted to um, yes. wish my condolences to his family <clears throat> and um, and recognize him. And it's great that you did that, though, because I think a lot of these guys, that's where they'd want to be. He, he, was not, he was not part of our group going over on the airplane, but he was part of the National World War II uh, Museum's group, uh, unfortunately, but uh, he passed away, but um, look, he was on his way back to revisit uh, the most significant part of his life, which was uh, fighting and winning the war uh, in World War II all those years ago. God bless him, and God bless all those who who are who are who we are losing. We're losing about a thousand World War II veterans a week, uh, and wow. they're rapidly, uh, you know, their numbers are dwindling. And so we have to take every opportunity right now to uh, learn from them and be with them. We have three more trips of our Soaring Valor trips coming up. Uh, another trip in July where we're taking uh, about 35 veterans down to the museum. Uh, same thing in August and same thing in September. We're, we're trying our best to get as many of them down to the museum to see this museum built in tribute to what they did all those years ago. It really is the national World War II Museum in New Orleans. I can't recommend it enough. Gary Sinise, when um, you um, got into this, you started out with a desire to help, and today you have multiple programs, this being one of them. Which is the, um, I don't want to say the top program, but I'd say the one that, that you get the most impact out of. Well, we, um, all our programs are impactful in, in various ways. Um, you know, I, I, I've sent my bands out hundreds of times to military bases and military hospitals uh, to perform for the, the men and women serving our country, uh, those who are going through rehabilitation at the hospitals. And when you see them come out and you see their faces light up, that's impactful. That's, that's making a difference. Yeah. That's, that's doing something really positive. But we also have other programs that are, are making a, a big difference. One of our programs is called RISE, Restoring Independence, Supporting Empowerment. It is a home building and a mobility device. Uh, you know, res- we restore independence through uh, specially adapted housing or... Uh, For those that are injured. You know, specially adapted vehicles, that kind of thing. Um, it's a tremendous, tremendous program. All those programs. Gary Sinise, you can hang on right there. I don't want to cut you off, but the music is going to cut us both off. Folks, we're on with Gary Sinise, uh, actor and veterans advocate. We're coming right back. We're going to continue the conversation on this 80th anniversary of D Day. Don't go anywhere. I'm Rich Valdez. By the way, your ratings are up. Congratulations. Thank I had somebody. You, it's always nice to check. I like to see, <laughs> even if they're friends, I like to see how are they doing. Are people listening, right? That's but right. You're, you're doing great. America at Night with Rich Valdez. All right, amigos, welcome back. We continue our conversation on this 80th anniversary of D-Day. And our guest is actor Gary Sinise. He's the head of the Gary Sinise Foundation. They do veterans advocacy. And... Gary Sinise, the, the importance um, that I took away from an interview that I once did with a World War II veteran early in my radio career um, really left me um, kind of like, wow, 
I was really wowed at, at just how much information was there and how how serious things were during that time. And I thought, you know, I'm so glad I did this interview and, you know, people can hear it forever, you know, on a podcast or whatever. But it it, it, it kind of reminded me of what you were talking about earlier, about how you had uh, videotaped your, your uncle and wanted to offer that to other people so that they could also relive that that kind of memory and have that information available. Because to me, the, these heroes are a treasure trove of information and history and heroism. And um, I'm interested in knowing how has this program that you've uh, implemented funding these, these videos, uh, how has that unfolded and how's it doing? Well, you know, I, I wanted to do it in partnership with the National World War II Museum because they, mm -hmm. you know, they already had a program where they were documenting uh, World War II veterans and then they preserved them, these, these video documents, in their archive. They, they've got thousands of them. Uh, thousands of World War II veterans. And I said, well, you know, how can we get more of them? Uh, so we started funding one historian, uh, and now we're funding two. And these historians go out all over the country. They've, you know, we, we find out about a World War II veteran. They'll deploy the, the historian out to whatever state and town uh, the veteran is in and sit down and record him and talk to him and get his story documented, and then they preserve it. And they use these uh, these videotapes at the National World War II Museum. You can walk through the museum, and you can press something, and you can see a picture of a young guy, and then you press <laughs> press the little, the little button, and all of a sudden the older veteran comes on, and he's talking about his experiences in World War II. It really is a great way uh, for kids to learn. And, we, uh, you know, part of our program, too, is that we – pair up high school students with these veterans that we send down there. So we've sent, you know, as I said, hundreds of veterans there, but we've also sent hundreds of high school students and you will, you will, we'll pick a school. We determine a school. we get a group. We pair up high school students with the veteran. They travel with the veteran on the airplane. They spend the next day all, all day at the museum, walking through the museum with the veteran and then they fly home with the veterans. It's a life-changing thing for a, a young student, and it really is a, a, a great way for these students to learn about the cost of freedom and what happened all those years ago, and how it, you know, and how it affects them. It's affect it's affected all of us. If we'd lost that war, we'd all be living very differently right now. Oh, that's the truth, folks. We're on with Gary Sinise, um, the actor and veterans advocate. And Gary, tell me, um, switching gears just a little bit, uh, obviously you have a, an illustrious career as an actor and, and now uh, an equally as um, impactful career in veterans advocacy. Tell me how loving your country and embracing patriotism has, um, if it has, ostracized you from Hollywood. I know that that's happened to a lot of people that tend to uh, embrace the country. Oh, not at all. Uh, not at all for me. Uh, I'm, I'm just I'm just doing what I think is, is right. Um, you know, I've been very I've got veterans in my family going back to World War One. So a lot of veterans in my family. It all starts there with me. After I played Lieutenant Dan and Forrest Gump, I started working with our wounded. Now, this, this is 30 years ago. Forrest Gump came out 30 years ago this summer. Wow. Uh, and I started working with the DAV after that, uh, Disabled American Veterans Organization. And then after September 11th, I, I just dove in full force, started working with the USO. And, you know, I had Vietnam veterans in my family, and I remember what it was like for them to come home from war and, and uh, to a very divided nation, a nation that had really turned its back on them. And when we deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan, I just I, I didn't want to see that happen to our active duty service members who were responding to the events of September 11th. So I raised my hand, just started going out there and I'm just doing what I think is right. I, I, I love the country. I want to participate in the defense of our country. The, the only way for me to do that, I'm not going to put on a uniform, but I can back up the people that do wear the uniform and mm -hmm. let them know they're appreciated. Folks, we're on with Gary Sinise. Now, Gary Sinise, let everybody know how, they can support the amazing work that you're doing at the Gary Sinise Foundation? Well, for, first thing I, I would recommend, go to the Gary Sinise Foundation website, GarySiniseFoundation.org. 
uh, check out the programs on the foundation, uh, on the pages of the foundation, go to the YouTube channel. You'll see dozens of videos showing our programs in action. As I mentioned, our home building program where we build homes for very badly wounded service members. I've been involved in 92 specially adapted smart technology, mortgage free homes for, you know, double amputees, quadruple amputees, triple amputees, very uh, serious burns and traumatic brain injuries, all kinds of injuries. And we've gotten these families into specially adapted housing. Uh, that's very important. That can change their life and uh, give them an opportunity to move forward and have more independence. That's just one of the programs at the foundation. Another thing that you'll see on the homepage of the foundation uh, sadly, my son passed away in uh, my January. Uh, he passed away in January. He worked for the foundation until he was too sick. He had a very rare cancer called Chordoma. But there's a beautiful story on the homepage of the website. And then toward the end of his life, he, he was a musician. He went back to music, and he created an album in the final months of his wow. life. And that album is... Uh, available at the Gary Sinise Foundation website. It's called Resurrection and Revival. And my son's name is Mac. And you can go to Mac Sinise YouTube and you can see the videos that were created uh, in the studio when uh, when he went into the studio and recorded the record. It's really beautiful. And, and as he wanted, all the proceeds from the sales of the record go to the Gary Sinise Foundation to help us in our mission to help veterans and military families. Wow, that's that's moving. It's a beautiful story. And again, my uh, condolences. Folks, check out the Gary Sinise Foundation website, GarySiniseFoundation.org. Uh, Gary Sinise, final words for America. Um, God bless America. That's, uh, that's, that's what I say. We, we, we can never do enough for the men and women yeah. who protect us and defend us. Uh, and, and God bless all those who serve out there. Amen to that. Keep doing what you're doing, fighting the good fight. We appreciate it. You are a gentleman, a scholar, and a patriot. Godspeed to you, sir. Thanks for having me, Rich. You bet. Folks, we're coming right back with your phone calls, D-Day stories, shout-outs to veterans in your family, and more. Uh, then we're going to switch gears and uh, remember the life of Ronaldus Magnus. That's uh, President Ronald Reagan, the 40th president of the United States. Uh, yesterday was his, I believe, the 20th anniversary of his passing, if I, if I know how to count. So we will um, continue our discussions straight ahead. Don't go anywhere. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-482-5337. That's Valdez with an S. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-482-5337. For Valdez, that's Valdez with an S. Today, NATO stands at 32 countries strong, and NATO is more united than ever, and even more prepared to keep the peace, deter aggression, defend freedom all around the world. America has invested in our alliances and forged new ones, not simply out of altruism, but out of our own self-interest as well. America's unique ability to bring countries together is an undeniable source of our strength and our power. Isolationism was not the answer 80 years ago and is not the answer today. That is President Joe El Baboso Biden at the D-Day uh, commemoration ceremony in Normandy, France. And... While he's there, you know, patting himself on the back and uh, giving uh, these accolades to NATO, there are veterans that actually served in World War II that feel like foreigners in their own country today. And one of those was on Fox doing an interview, and we have a clip of it. His name is Ronald Scharf, 
And he was in, in Normandy when he gave the interview. This was yesterday with Martha McCallum. And it's an eye-opener. Listen to this. When you're here with all of these brothers and people who experienced the war as you did, and also um, the subsequent wars in Korea and Vietnam, what do you think about the state of our country today? How do you feel about the, the country that you worked so hard to, to stay free, to keep free? The real truth? Yeah. I, I feel like a foreigner in my own country lots of times, and I, I don't like it. It makes my heart real heavy. And uh, I, I just hope we can pull out of this. There's too much, too much Hollywood going on in Washington all the time. The important subjects they don't cover. So the thing is, I, ho I hope that uh, I hope all the guys will rally up and we'll go back and straighten it all out. Again, that is uh, World War II veteran Ron Scharf uh, sharing that he is feeling disconnected from his Americanism, feeling like a foreigner in his own country because there's too much Hollywood going on in Washington. And, and I've got to say, this is a, a very generous statement, right? Um, he's definitely not um, naming people by name, but you can tell he's upset that, you know, he fought for this country and the theatrics that he sees coming out of his nation's capital are displeasing. And, and I can't I can't argue that, right? But he didn't stop there. He went on and he said that this current generation is a bit lazy and needs more patriotism. Listen to this. Do you think 16-year-olds would, would fake their age as you did in order to go off and fight for the country today, 16-year-olds today? No, I don't think so. It, it was a diff different generation. Each generation is a little bit different. And I, I think that the, all the generations are great, but I think some of the ones I got now are a little lazy. And I, I think they got to show more pride in their country than they do. I, I don't. I don't. I don't like to see that. Where I'll take a flag and put a drape it around them, or uh, put it on top of a jeep or something like that. You got to respect your flag. That's your country. And uh, I, I'm just hoping I never run into anything where somebody's trying to burn the flag. Because I'll stop them right now. <laughs> you gotta love these old timers. God bless them, and I believe them. I believe every word of what he's saying. And uh, again, I want to go to the phones. If you have some old timers in your family that you want to share a story about, feel free. Let's go to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, KDKA, and check in with Bill. Go right ahead. You're on with Rich Valdez. Welcome. All right, Bill. Appreciate that. I guess we don't have Bill. But ultimately, we look at this um, situation with the generation today. And again, very, very kind statement, right? He said, I feel like they're a bit lazy. You know, if you ask me, I'd say I think the, the current generation of 16-year-olds of has no clue what patriotism is. And I'm not faulting them. I'm faulting those who are responsible for teaching them because they've been taught to loathe this country. They've been taught that America is bad and oppressive and somehow um, just one big evil colonizer that shouldn't exist that has a constitution that's racist and misogynistic and oppressive. And when you're cut from that cloth, you're never going to rise to the challenge of defending your nation, of, of, you know, lying when you're 16, saying that you're 18 so you can go to the war and fight for your country. I think that era is, is long gone, and we can only hope and pray that it comes back, that will one day, and not that I want 16-year-olds to go to war, but... I think it's, it's a healthy thing for a country to have 16-year-olds that are willing to lay down their life because they love their country so much. That's a beautiful thing. Folks, keep it locked right here. We're coming right back. It's the 80th anniversary of the D-Day commemoration in Normandy, France. Your calls and more straight ahead. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. Call 
now. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. Seven decades ago, the warriors of D-Day fought a sinister enemy who spoke of a thousand-year empire. In defeating that evil, they left a legacy that will last not only for a thousand years, but for all time. For as long as the soul knows of duty and honor, for as long as freedom keeps its hold on the human heart. To the men who sit behind me and to the boys who rest in the field before me, your example will never, ever grow old. That is uh, President Trump at the 75th commemoration of D-Day. And uh, again, that was five years ago when he was uh, in the White House. And this is one of those things we can't get enough of, right? We should never forget these things, the sacrifice that these men made, the blood that was spilled. Let's go to the phones. I think we've got Bill back. The deep state tried to get him, but you can't keep a good man down. Bill on KDKA, go right ahead. Hi, Rich. I, I, I just want to give you a little story. Uh, I, had, I had an uncle that I never met. He was uh, He died. He was killed in Korea uh, a year before I was born. Uh, never got to meet him. But, I mean, he, he wasn't just your average grunt soldier. He was actually, he was a lieutenant. And he, he, got, uh, he got letters off to my grandmother and his mm-hmm. uh, fiance back in the day, back in the time. And, 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 and the letters just said, how low they were on ammunition. I mean, they had nothing. And, 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 uh, he said in the letters, he didn't even expect that him and his, uh, his company would, would actually make it out within a Isn't week. Isn't that amazing? I think it's amazing how they faced all of these challenges and they still, uh, were able to get the job done and, and, you know, he may not have made it home to tell the story, and uh, God bless him, and of course, thanks for his service. But some did, and, and they all did what they had to do, and, and that is just remarkable. Bill in Pittsburgh, thank you. Um, salute to your uncle. Let's go to Terre Haute, Indiana, WIBQ. Check in with Logan. Logan, go right ahead very quickly. Hey, Rich. Uh, great to have you. Appreciate uh, taking the call. I've listened to you for a while. Uh, you Thank do a you. great job. I just wanted to speak about earlier what you were talking about uh, with 16, 16 year olds mm-hmm. and uh, going back. Uh, I, I'm 25 years old and I feel that maybe back in the day before the internet, there was uh, an easier time to get people to rally together, but it's maybe harder to propagandize. Uh, events now, especially wars, and maybe people my age, especially from my opinion, I feel like we have a a larger threat within our country rather than fighting over in Ukraine or fighting overseas in the Middle East. Um, And and that's kind of my take on it. Uh, God bless the veterans and and thank God for their service. We absolutely definitely needed them. But just as a young man's perspective, I, I think that we have a lot of stuff we've got to take care of home rather than sending younger people overseas. Thank you, Logan. I appreciate it. And um, this is one of those where we'll probably always uh, disagree. If my daughters want to serve, I, I encourage them to do it. it it's if, 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 if not us, but who, right? That's what Reagan said, and that's the truth. Folks, we're coming right back. Hour number two. Don't go anywhere. I'm Rich Valdez. city that never sleeps 17 miles from madison square garden new york city it's america at night with rich valdez america's favorite late night talk program featuring interesting guests from around the world and calls from across america and now here is your host rich valdez
Hi there, good evening, and what's up, America? I am Rich Valdez, Valdez with an S, at Rich Valdez on all of the social media. Your liberty-loving Latino amigo, happy to be here with you this Thursday night. It's the 80th anniversary of D-Day. And it's also the 20th anniversary of the passing of Ronald Reagan, at least yesterday was. And we mentioned it yesterday. We're going to get into that a little bit more now. But uh, if you want to join our conversation, the phone number is 833-482-5337-833. The number four, my last name, Valdez. And that's Valdez with an S. And I want to obviously bring your attention to what's happening in the news, right? We have Biden in Normandy, France. Uh, having some very confusing moments. Uh, at one point, he's rushed off the stage, and he he leaves the American veterans and, and others that are there to be greeted by Emmanuel Macron. Um, I don't know why Jill Biden kind of uh, whisked him away, but that's what happened. Um, doesn't surprise me. Joe El Maboso Biden strikes again. But what's more important are the words that that he leaves behind. And there's no comparison between the remarks that were offered by President Biden and the remarks that were offered by the 40th president of the United States, Ronald Reagan, who L. Rushbo used to call Ronaldus Magnus. And I have a clip uh, from the 40th commemoration of D-Day And I want you to listen to this. Check it out. Today, on June 6th, 2024, the country and the world will commemorate the 80th anniversary of the D-Day landings in Normandy, an occasion marked brilliantly by President Reagan 40 years ago on that day in 1984, when he delivered one of his most famous speeches, highlighting the selfless and heroic action of the boys of Pointe du Hoc when he said, Behind me is a memorial that symbolizes the ranger daggers that were thrust into the top of these cliffs. And before me are the men who put them there. These are the boys of Puente Hope. These are the men who took the cliffs. These are the champions who helped free a continent. These are the heroes who helped end a war. Again, and that's just a part of, of an amazing uh, speech by President Reagan. And I want to talk about the Reagan Legacy Foundation, what it is, how it began, and how you all that are listening can help. And to do that, we're going to talk with the president of the Reagan Legacy Foundation. He's also an author and a Newsmax contributor. And he also happens to be the oldest son of President Ronald Reagan. Michael Reagan, welcome back. Is there someone older than me? <laughs> no. No? So I'm the oldest son? Wow. <laughs> Feeling younger every day. <laughs> That's a good thing. <laughs> good to be with you. That's, you bet. So tell us um, a little bit as you know, we reflect on, on D-Day and, and the um, Point du Oak speech and... I'd love to know more about what you're doing, what you're up to at the Reagan Legacy Foundation. Michael Reagan. Well, we started the Reagan Legacy Foundation in the early 2000s, right after the USS Ronald Reagan was commissioned. Mm-hmm. Um, as and Because what I wanted to do, see, you know, as my dad's name's on the back of the ship, I uh, wanted to be able to do something for the sailors who served. So what we do is set up a scholarship program for the men and women who serve aboard the USS Ronald Reagan and the scholarship program for their family members left at home when they're out at sea doing the things that they're doing. And they're trying to better their education also. And so that's how we began the Reagan Legacy Foundation. We're still doing it. We give $1,000 checks to the kids on the ship. We have $2,000 checks to the uh, family members left home. They go online, they put in all the information, our board looks at it, chooses the one we're going to give money to, and that's how that works. And then, well, wasn't too many years ago, um, I was invited to raise the American flag at the American Cemetery in Normandy. And it was interesting because I was, play- I was playing golf with a young man a couple of days before that, 25 years old. And I said, you know, I've said in Normandy to do that. 
and he didn't know why there was an American cemetery in Normandy. Wow. <clears throat> and I ended the uh, golf game with him. <coughs> Excuse me. Sure. <coughs> His golf game with him by basically saying, did you think D-Day is when your report card came home? <laughs> um, so, you know, I was went over to Normandy and looked around. I knew St. Mary Glee's where they filmed The Longest Day because St. Mary Glee's the first town freed by America, 4 a.m. in the morning on D-Day. And went to their museum there, met the people, met the met the sons who were the children of the D-Day mayor, and said, gosh, what can we do here? And I think it was my wife that came up with the idea to, why don't we start a brick project where people go online and purchase a brick, the name of someone who served in the European theater, Second World War, uh, send us the information, we'll have the brick made and put in the ground there at St. Mary Glees. We'll send them a photograph of it what have you, and information. That way, if they ever go to St. Mary Glees, Normandy, France, they can look at that brick. If they don't know anybody, we have plenty of names of those who served. And what we do is we take a name, put it on that brick, and send you the picture of the brick. And we started that about seven years ago, five, seven years ago. And uh, it's been great, great program. And we have what they call the walkway to victory, which you go online RegularLegacyFoundation.org, and look for Walkway to Victory. And that's our brick project there at Normandy, France, at St. Mary Glees. Outstanding. Now, M- Michael Reagan, uh, in addition to the brick project, uh, what are some of the other projects that you guys work on at the Reagan Legacy Foundation? Those really keep pretty much of our time uh, between the, raising the money for the, for the scholarship program. The scholarships. And so you don't have to give a thousand or two thousand. You just, you know, give a hundred bucks. We just add it all together and figure it out. The bricks are two hundred and fifty dollars a piece. We are a five hundred one c three, so it's tax deductible to you. Uh, and uh, what have you? Uh, we used to do some things with kids all over the world. We used to be able to take them to different places of the world and educate them on uh, the history of the United States, the history of the Second World War, history of you know, the Holocaust and what have you, but it got so cost prohibitive because of insurance and you're dealing with children and all these other things. So we had to move that away and just concentrate on the bricks and on the scholarship program. And that keeps us, uh, it keeps us pretty busy. I bet it does. Folks, we're on with Michael Reagan, who is the president of the Reagan Legacy Foundation. You uh, no doubt heard him on the radio, seen him on Newsmax TV. And I've heard him on this program before. And we're going to come back and continue discussing the legacy of the 40th president of the United States, Ronald Reagan. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Well, thank you, Rich, and thank you for everything. I know you very well, and I have I listen, but I have a lot of people that listen, and they love your show, and I appreciate it very much. America at Night with Rich Valdez. Freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it on to our children in the bloodstream. The only way they can inherit the freedom we have known is if we fight for it, protect it, defend it, and then hand it to them with the well-taught lessons of how they in their lifetime must do the same. And if you and I don't do this, then you and I may well spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it once was like in America when men were free. Spine-tingling indeed. Uh, Truer words have never been spoken, and we should never forget those words. Our guest is Michael Reagan. He is the president of the Reagan Legacy Foundation. And Michael Reagan, when you hear those words from your father, uh, no doubt it reminds you of the importance of carrying on the legacy that he's left behind. And and tell us about how it impacts and influences and continues to shape the generations to come. It it really does. And but you've got, again, you've got to teach history. And today, the kids think the history started when they woke up this morning and got out of bed. <laughs> uh, we don't teach history anymore. You know, I think about those clips you just played. I thought, 
about my dad's 1976 speech in Kansas City where he lost the nomination. Mm. And he told all of us that he was asked to write a letter to put into a time capsule that would be opened up on the 300th anniversary of the United States of America. And he wondered, what do I write about? And all it came down, freedom. Knowing that if we don't make the right decisions now, that generation may not even have the freedom to open up the time capsule to read what he's put into it. I mean, he was so far ahead of his time. Yeah. If you just listen to him and, and pay attention to what he was saying, he spoke to us in parables and what have you. Um, no, it's just, it's, he was a one of a kind in his time and did so many great things and left us so many legacy things, even though he wasn't looking for a legacy, he left us a lot of those things that we just grab hold of. And we should, you know, we should spend time teaching our kids about that era of America and who we are, why, why there's a D-Day, why we did what we had to do. The world looks at the United States of America as a beacon of, beacon of freedom. When we cease to be free, so is the rest of the world. And unfortunately, right now, Rich, you've got a situation. You don't have the Lex Valences, the Baca Hobbles, the Helmut Kohl's, Mikhail Gorbachev, Pope John Paul II, Margaret Thatcher, Ronald Reagan. They don't exist in the world today. And so where are those leaders? And, and so they all look to the United States. They all look to Washington for that leadership. And when it's not there, when there's a void there, there's a void everywhere. And that's, that's what's really scary. That's why I do what I do with the scholarship program, with the Brick Project, carrying the legacy, you know, my father and going out and speaking on those things. I worked with the Young Americas Foundation, who bought my dad's ranch, and, and talked to young people. I'll be talking to 200 high school students on the 19th of this month at the Young Americas Foundation at their building up there in, in Santa Barbara before they go to the ranch the next day. So I spend my time doing that, because if I don't, who is? Right. For, famous words, right, from Ronald Reagan. If, if, if not us, who? If not now, then when? Now, folks, check out the Reagan Legacy Foundation website at reaganlegacyfoundation.org. Michael Reagan, as we're talking about freedom and we're talking about the, the impact of, of protecting freedom and how it's never more than one generation away from becoming extinct, I can't help but think we're in this pivotal election year and pivotal because we've already seen what can happen with uh, the current administration and we can pivot away from it uh, should we go in a different direction. And I think the stakes are pretty high. How do you weigh in on this election? What do you, what do you think? Well, what do I think? I mean, I, 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 to me, I only got one choice. I mean, do I want yeah. four more years of Biden? I mean, look what he's done in three and a half. If you, <laughs> if you reelect him, he's going to feel he's had, he has a mandate to go further which is really scary when you really think about it. And, and so there's only one choice, you know, Donald Trump, I mean, Donald Trump knows that and what have you, um, you know, you, you just sit there be mad at him for this, mad at him for that. Has he screwed up a lot? Absolutely. But when he was president of the United States, the country was better off. Economy was better off. The world was better off and what have you. And uh, that certainly isn't happening today. We reelected Biden, and we have two wars going on and the threat of a third one. What do you think we get with four more years? We get the third one? Is that what we get? You know, and today the President of the United States is more concerned about getting everybody involved with the Ukraine. And it's just, it's mind-boggling. And if you get this, I hate Trump so much, I'm willing to destroy the country because I hate Trump. Right. I mean, basically, that, cutting, that's, cutting your nose off to logo. spite your face. Yeah, absolutely right. I mean, if I tell one story, I tell kids at the library when I take people on tours there, how quickly you lose your freedom. Think about dad's mm-hmm. talk. I told the young kids to come on tours. I take them out to the Berlin Wall. I said, take, I take them back to August 12th, 1961. They come home from school. They see mom. They said, mom, you know, Aunt Sophie has invited me to come over for dinner and a movie. And your mom says, to you, oh, honey, that's great. Go have dinner with my aunt and my sister. Go to a movie. It gets to be too late, honey. Spend the night. August 12, 1961. So you go there. 
and you spend the night. You know when you come home, Rich? Mm-hmm. November of 1989. Wow. That's when you come home. That's how quickly you can lose your freedom, literally overnight. That's how quickly. And, and when you really put that in perspective, you go, that's scary as hell. In fact, I went to dinner with my aunt and went to a movie, and now I'm here until I either can break out or somebody gets me out. Yeah, until you're rescued. November 1989. That's how quickly you can lose your freedom. Crazy times. So now, Michael Reagan, when you look at that historical context and and you apply it to to where we are today uh, with the stuff you just mentioned, um, you know, two two active wars going on, the threat of a possible third, uh, all all this um, destabilization that we see in the world. Do you think just changing presidents gets us uh, away from that? Do you think more needs to be done? What's the remedy? Remedy is the election. I mean, you go back and look at 1980, the malaise that we were in, double-digit inflation, you know, gas lines, all the stuff we were going through. Military wouldn't wear their uniforms because they were embarrassed to. One election. Ronald Reagan's elected, takes the oath of office. Hostages come home. <laughs> God bless you. Excuse me. Hostages come home. Military puts their uniforms back on. Everybody's proud to be an American. One election. One election. That's what it takes. And it could yeah. go either way. I mean, you have one election to turn it around the other way. Right. It's, it's, yeah. You got to be involved. You got you to be involved. Say, well, you know, yeah, I didn't like the way. Like, yeah. Quit whining and really sit down and think about it. Because oh. I'm tired mm-hmm. of people saying, I... I hate Trump, so I'm not going to vote. Great. So your vote doesn't count, and who does? You know, the Biden people are going to show up. They're going to show up. All right. The question so is, what will we? Do? Yeah, Michael Reagan, let everybody up? know uh, before we. I don't want to run out of time and not have a chance to plug your stuff. Uh, ReaganLegacyFoundation.org is the website. Tell everybody how they can find you on social media. At Reagan World. I'm a great Twitter and an X, whatever it is today. And the, uh, yeah, at Reagan World. Follow me there. I put my columns up there. A lot of stuff there at Reagan World, if you will. Follow him at Reagan World. That's at Reagan World on Twitter, which uh, a lot of people call X nowadays. And Michael Reagan, in the minute or so that we have remaining, half a minute or so, um, is there an additional website or is it just ReaganLegacyFoundation.org? RegularLegacyFoundation.org. That's where you go, see what we're doing with the foundation, and, mm-hmm. and go from there and get yourself a brick that's tax deductible. And remember one of those who gave us the freedom we have today. Michael Reagan, you are a gentleman, a scholar, and a patriot. I want to thank you for being with us. Godspeed to you, sir. Thank you, Rich. Valdez, who again will do a fine job, but I know you'll enjoy listening to it. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Well, I think it's time we ask ourselves if we still know the freedoms that were intended for us by the founding fathers. Not too long ago, two friends of mine were talking to a Cuban refugee, a businessman who had escaped from Castro. And in the midst of his story, one of my friends turned to the other and said, we don't know how lucky we are. And the Cuban stopped and said, how lucky you are. I had some place to escape to. And in that sentence, he told us the entire story. If we lose freedom here, there's no place to escape to. This is the last stand on earth. And this idea that government is beholden to the people, that it has no other source of power except the sovereign people, is still the newest and the most unique idea in all the long history of man's relation to man. That is uh, President Reagan and uh, delivering some remarks from his famous time for choosing speech. And those words couldn't be any truer today than they were back then. We have to fight for our freedom. We have to stand up for what's right. There's no other way. This is it, right? This is uh, the, the, where the rubber meets the road, as they say. 
And somebody who understands the importance of this being it is Clint Bruce. He's a retired Navy SEAL. He's co-founder of Carry the Load. It's a nonprofit that provides an active way to connect Americans to the sacrifices made each day by our military veterans and first responders. Clint Bruce, welcome to the program. I mean, thank you for having me. And thank you for playing President Reagan's words at the beginning. They're always, it's always sobering and, and encouraging to be reminded of those. Yeah, yeah I, I agree with that. Now, uh, Clint, I want to um, get a sense from you as we're, you know, um, the news of the day is the 80th anniversary uh, or commemoration of, of D-Day. And mm-hmm. we, we're, we're looking at that. I, I can't help but juxtapose that with where we are in the world today. Um, in reality, you know, a stone's throw away from a potential third world war. And I feel like so much of the work that you're doing gets drowned out with all of this dire news about, you know, who's messing this up and who's making mistakes here and there. And there's definitely no shortage of, of people making bad choices. But I feel like the, the men and women of the military sometimes just don't get enough credit for what they're doing. So tell us about the work that you're doing at Carry the Load. Well, Carry the Load is remarkable. It's, it's something I'm proud to have been a part of. And, you know, my, my good friend Stephen Hawley and I, we played football together at the Naval Academy, served in a special operations community together. And one of the things we were just really frustrated with as we transitioned from service is how it just did not feel to us like the nation was doing Memorial Day the way we needed it to, to reconcile the loss for our friends. And and then, frankly, to be honest with you, I was I, as mad as I was at, 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 at our nation during Memorial Day. I was also mad at myself because I had not done Memorial Day well, well myself until I started losing my friends. So, you know, the majority of anger is pointed inside. And, and, and for me, the way to reconcile anger is with action. And so what I started doing in the mid-2000s was just putting a pound in my pack for every friend that I'd lost and just walking so I couldn't walk anymore on Memorial Day. And, and what I found is how many people wanted to do that. And, and you know, for the last God, 13 years, we've seen uh, incredible stories of people all over the United States walking next to someone who lost someone. We simply ask the question, hey, who are you carrying? And then we listen with a righteous reverence that we should. And then we share our own stories. And what we find is, you know, when you slow down enough to talk and listen, a, a lot of things reconcile themselves. And, and uh, you know, I'm, you know, I'm I'm not convinced that the world is worse than it's ever been. I am convinced that the loudest and worst voices, uh, are, uh, the worst voices are the loudest, and it. And I think uh, we need to be encouraged by the fact that, despite what you hear, there are millions of great people going to work every day, doing the best they can to help others, and and the clarity that was offered on. On D-Day, it's not a clarity that we should envy at all because the clarity that D-Day aligned against was an absolute evil um, that threatened the world. And that's what made things so clear back then. And and, and uh, we should not be envious of, of that enemy that they had, but sometimes it just takes a, an adversary to remind everybody what's really important. And I think we should marvel at what those men did today, 80 years ago, and, and all the planning that went into it and the valor and courage in the days following, it's 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 right to remember this day for for those actions, folks. We are continuing our discussion this evening with Clint Bruce, retired Navy SEAL and co-founder of Carry the Load, and it's remarkable work. It's necessary work, but it's it's not being done, I guess, as, as much as it ought to be, right? You, you've got your work cut out for you. You've got a lot on your plate. How can the listeners that are listening help support the work that you're doing? Yeah, well, i tell you what, I, when you say stuff like that, it gets me excited, man, because I'm one of my favorite quotes of every movie I've ever seen is you know, Han Solo never telling the odds, right? Like when it's bad, it's when uh, the best people get, get their best. And, you know, it's, People want to go to carrytheload.org and learn about it. We just wrapped up the 2024 uh, event. It was remarkable, but there's a persistent effort year-round. There's other amazing foundations that are doing work year-round. One of the things we try to do with Carry the Load is really create this concept of Memorial May where you use the entirety of May to, to first and foremost, recognize the sacrifices of, of, of families of, of the fallen military 
And second, to extend that recognition to the other sacrificial services, which for me has always been fire, rescue, and law enforcement. Um, and so for us, our, our emphasis is May and, and, and to celebrate those who are working year round. And so I guarantee you, any of your listeners, it would not be hard to find a, a, a powerful organization doing amazing work right in your backyard. And, you know, I love the national efforts. Those are very important. But a lot of times the best work can just be done by walking out of your front door and, and walking across the street and, and helping your neighbor. I mean, you know, we were talking earlier today, I was interviewed by several people earlier today about kind of the leadership of, of Normandy and, 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 and my, I didn't contest their opinion of leadership as, as far as, but for me, leadership is, is this fluid term. It's all, for me, leading is a verb. And if you're leading, you're a leader, regardless of what your rank is. And, you know, rank and roll really describe how many people are hoping you get it right. But on that beach 80 years ago, there was a leadership every five feet. Um, you know, as chaos grows, the leadership circle shrinks and, you know, there are, there are hundreds of thousands of leaders on that day and the days following. And, and, and the point of that is, is never wait for someone else to lead you to where you think you ought to be. F find the first thing you can do, use the gifts that God has given you and, and take that first hill and then take the next one and the next one. Uh, Cause momentum, momentum does matter. Momentum and virtuous momentum tends to win. Folks don't go anywhere. We're going to continue our conversation with Clint Bruce, retired Navy SEAL co-founder of carry the load. Don't go anywhere. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. I know for years you've resisted the idea of American weapons being used for any sort of direct strike inside Russia. But we did witness this shift in recent days, authorizing American weapons for limited direct strikes. Are American weapons being used right now inside Russia? They're authorized to be used in proximity to the border. We're not authorizing strikes 200 miles into Russia. We're not authorizing strikes on Moscow, on the Kremlin. That is President Biden, who I like to call Joe El Baboso Biden, saying, yes, uh, U.S. Uh, munitions are being used and they were authorized to be used uh, 20 miles near the border, but not uh, at the Kremlin. Um, this sounds like uh, fighting words to me. He went on to say that he's known Putin for 40 years and the guy's always been a dictator. I want to get some reaction from our guest because uh, this sounds like some tough talk to me. Clint Bruce, retired Navy SEAL, co-founder of Carry the Load. What's your, your reaction to this audio clip from President Biden? I think you always got to take those in context and see a trend, see a consistency. I mean, I think it's um, easy to say things every once in a while, but you got to see a consistent thing. And as it relates to Putin, man, he, he is he is who everyone thinks he is. I mean, he is a, he is a guy dedicated to the rise of Russian nationalism, the, the way he remembers it and is committed to that cause and is formidable in every sense and not to be taken lightly. And um, he seeks and exploits weakness. So you can't be weak. Right. And uh, it's my opinion that Biden tends to be weak. And that's why Biden uh, gets taken advantage of by Putin. Your thoughts? Well, and that's why the consistency thing matters, right? Like, so for me, when you see someone be, you know, you go back to the president that you played at the very beginning, you know, listen to him being consistent. President Reagan was consistent. Our greatest leaders yeah. have always been consistent. And even the ones I don't necessarily agree with ideologically, if, if they're consistent, um, th that matters, right? And so consistency matters, not just popularity, not just saying the things that you think people want to hear. Um, and and I, I think all, all all strong men and women respect 
other people of consistency. So it's important that we stay totally consistent. Now, do you see a way out from, from your position, from, you know, the experience you've had, do you see a way out uh, other than just putting an end to it and saying, hey, we're, we're pulling out of Ukraine, we're not going to send any more money, we're taking our, you know, advisory troops out of there, um, or is there another way? Yeah, I, I, I don't necessarily know how to answer that well, and I'm not one to speculate on on, on what we should and shouldn't do. You know, I, I think at the end of the day, this, the stronger America becomes, the more formidable America's words become to anybody, you know, be it China, be it Russia, be it any adversary. And I think um, we could spend a lot of time talking about what America ought to be doing at the expense of what everybody listening right now and what I could do tomorrow morning when we wake up to make this America what it's supposed to be. And I'm far more interested in talking about, um, because I can do something about how to make our America better tomorrow. And for people that want to support the work that you're doing uh, with the organization, Carry the Load, your nonprofit, let everybody know how they can help. Yeah, and go to carrytheload.org and, and learn more about what Carry the Load has been doing. And, and really pay attention. When you go to carryload.org, you're going to find a page that calls about our beneficiaries. And the beneficiaries are the foundations that we support during the month of May. The, uh, bear with me, i got a hammer alert coming in. Uh, you'll see a list of, of, of highly vetted and highly scrutinized and very, very um, influential and successful foundations that we support. And so as you click to carry the load, go to the beneficiaries page and learn more about the people that we take care of um, during that month. Again, uh, the website is carrytheload.org, carrytheload.org. Our guest is Clint Bruce. Clint, I want to thank you for being with us tonight. You are a gentleman, a scholar, and a patriot. Keep up the great work. Well, I appreciate you holding the line and, 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 and speaking truth to power, and, and your story is remarkable. I mean, you are, you are America. Your story is the American story. Wake up, work hard, do it again the next day. Uh, and, and so thank it's fun you. to be visiting with you. Amen. I hope to have you back soon. Clint sure. Bruce, everybody. Now, when we return, we're going to squeeze in a couple of calls, and uh, I'm going to lay out what we're going to be discussing in Open Phone America. We're going to do it a little different tonight, and uh, can't wait for that. Don't go anywhere. I'm Rich Valdez. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833 482 America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. All right, amigos, welcome back. And we're going to be um, getting to Open Phone America shortly. Uh, there was a suggestion from a caller uh, to do a topic uh, during open phones about your favorite talk radio traditions, uh, memories, stories, things of that nature. Uh, I'm open to that because tomorrow is the annual Talkers Convention. We talked about it with Michael Harrison, the publisher of Talkers Magazine, not too long ago. Um, I don't know, a week ago, 10 days ago, something like that. And tomorrow's the big day where I get to go and schmooze and rub elbows with a bunch of my talk radio buddies, some that I know um, personally, some that I know by reputation. And it really is always a nice time. So I'm looking forward to that. And um, in honor of that, I was hoping to do a little bit of open phones tonight. We could uh, integrate that. And of course, continuing the theme of, of freedom and liberty and D-Day and commemorating that as well as the uh, 20th anniversary of the passing of 
President Ronald Reagan. So lots to discuss there. I'm going to go to Galloway, New Jersey. That's near Atlantic City, by the way. Uh, big shout out to WOND, great radio station in that Atlantic City area. Let's check in with our buddy Lance. Go right ahead. Hey, good evening, uh, Rich. Thanks very much for taking my call. Uh, I really enjoyed listening to your last guest there. That was very interesting and his viewpoints. But what Biden said today in regards or with that interview uh, about America giving the OK, the green light for Ukraine to use our weapons to go 200 miles in. And like I, I told your screener that the demilitarized zone in, in North Korea and South Korea is 260 miles long and only maybe two and a half miles or two and a quarter miles wide. So is he trying to establish or let NATO? Couldn't answer. He's not here to answer it. What else you got, Lance? Uh, well, basically, uh, the talkers t- tomorrow, I w- uh, congratulations, I called you that. It's like a pre-Father's Day gift to you. I think I told you that the last time you were talking about it. But uh, yeah. I wish you well. And uh, what number are you? Uh, I went up seven spots. I honestly don't remember. I think so. I, th- I might be 80 or 81. And uh, I'm happy to be 80 and 81. Somebody, uh, several people have told me, they're like, ah, it can't be. It's rigged. It's fixed. There's no way you're uh, that that uh, number. And I was just like, hey, I'm happy to be on the list. So I guess it's, um, you know, whether you look at the glass half full or half empty. Now, let me ask you, what do you think about Biden's remarks in Normandy? We played a couple of clips earlier. I'm not sure if you heard them. I, I, you know, he's beating on the war drums. And that's how Dem- all Democrats seem to start wars and then it takes Republicans to clean them up and get out. And unfortunately, this guy is like a, wants NATO to do it. And there's a few other countries that are definitely giving offensive weapons. But he's Johnny come lately. Everything we give him, all these things that we said, the jets, they still don't have them over there. They're still not. Fi- they don't have pilots. Those pilots never left our country. They, I don't know if they got trained to fly the jets we're supposed to give them, which are pretty much outdated. I mean, He's like a mild penetration, and he's screwing the United States over. That's all I can say about that. <laughs> Lance, y- y- you are a gentleman and a scholar. I always enjoy speaking with you. Big shout out to Lance and everybody listening on WOND in Galloway, New Jersey. Thanks, Lance. And uh, let's uh, wrap up here with Jim in Las Cruces, New Mexico, K O B E. Now, Jim, as my call screen is telling me, you want to talk about the predecessor to Larry King in this 10 o'clock time slot, Long John Neville. Yeah, uh, he, he goes way back. Um, can you hear me, Rich? Loud and clear. OK, good. Uh, he goes way back to the 50s, but uh, I listened to him in the 70s and I lived on Staten Island then. Mm-hmm. And I was kind of lonely and I would call in and he'd have these really out out and out well uh, really out there guests on all the time and i think that kind of like maybe later on inspired art bell because uh maybe probably back then art bell might have been more into politics but it was interesting, interesting. all the uh, zany people he would have on the show yep thank you jim uh i agree i think long john nebel who i've listened to more than i have uh, art bell um was uh was definitely out there big entertainer And thank you for your call. Folks, we're coming right back with Open Phone America. You know the number, 833-482-5337, 833-4-VALDEZ. Don't go anywhere. From the city that never sleeps. 17 miles from Madison Square Garden, New York City. It's America at Night with Rich Valdez. America's favorite late night talk program. Featuring interesting guests from around the world. And calls from across America. And now, here is your host, Rich Valdez. Hi there, good evening, and what's up, America? I am Rich Valdez, Valdez with an S, at Rich Valdez on all of the social media. 
Welcome to the program. It's hour number three. We call it Open Phone America. This is where we open up the phone lines and you get to call in on any topic you'd like. Uh, one of the things I wanted to throw out there was tomorrow is the Talkers Convention. And um, a caller mentioned that perhaps we should talk about uh, some of you all, the listeners, favorite talk radio moments, memories, and um, thoughts. So I'm open to doing that as well as we're talking about D-Day. If you want to shout out a World War II veteran in your family, feel free to do that. Share a story or an anecdote. And, uh, of course, the news of the day. We've been talking about uh, mainly that. We've talked about the 20th anniversary of the passing of President Ronald Reagan. And there's plenty to discuss, right? We, we haven't even broached upon the um, remarks from Mayorkas and others on on immigration following the um, implementation of Biden's executive order at at the uh, southern border. So we're going to get into that as well. I want to invite you to call 833-482-5337 is the phone number, 833-4-VALDEZ. And I want to uh, play a clip for you from a recent interview between Dr. Phil and President Trump. And Dr. Phil asks a very uh, poignant question, which is the left is consistently maligning Trump, saying that if he gets elected, this will be pure retribution. He's going to go after the people that went after him politically. And it would be lawfare meets lawfare. Trump set the record straight. Listen to this. I want to play what if with you for a minute. What if when you win this election, you said enough is enough. Too much is too much. This is a race to the bottom and it stops here. It stops now. They've made a half a dozen or more major attempts to take you off the playing board. And you just said it stops now. I am going to rise above this cycle of ugly. I'm not going to play this gotcha retribution game. It stops now. I am going to put the American people first, not getting my pound of flesh first. You got to do what you got to do, but I'm going to put this country as the shining city on the hill. I am moving forward. I'm not playing the retribution game. It stops with me. It stops here. What if you took that approach? I'm okay with that. I am. I'm okay with that. Uh, sometimes, uh, I'm sure in certain moments, I wouldn't be. We have to unite the country, Phil. The country has to be united. This country is a mess. Every situation needs a hero. What a great opportunity for you to stop this cycle, this vicious cycle of gotcha, gotcha back, gotcha, gotcha back. Every situation needs a hero. What, what a great opportunity to step up and say, you know what, it stops here, it stops with me. I think you'll be impressed. Uh, we have to unite the country. We have to save the country. Retribution is going to be through success. We're going to make it very successful. We have to bring the country together. Well, there you go. Donald Trump talking about unifying the country, bringing the, uh, the country together as part of the Trump policy for a, a, uh, another term. And uh, I think that sounds great. I think it sounds great because he understands that if you do do the same thing that the Democrats are doing, then we're really no better, right? That, that there has to be a high road that one can take. And if you're not taking the high road, then what are we doing? Now, I understand. There's a, a lot of critics don't like how nice I am or, or my, 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 my approach to these things, but I just don't believe that if, if we're always in a knockdown, drag em, blood sport of a brawl, where are we going to get? Now, listen, you got to fight sometimes. I'm not saying you don't, but I'm not, I'm not saying that we got to fight all the time, at least that way, right? It can't be, it can't be knock down, drag them every single time because we'll never get anything done. We'll never get anywhere. It's not wise, in my opinion, for America to be divided, right? The United States should be United States, not divided states. There's always been political differences in America. Yes, indeed, there was a time with um, Hamilton and Aaron Burr and, and their little duel. That was a time in our history. There was a time in our history where, you know, sometimes certain sessions of, of, uh, of debate broke out into uh, fisticuffs. But I think 
we've come away from that. And honestly, that's not how it started. Those are all the exceptions, not the rule. Again, yesterday we talked about how the, the founders who drafted our founding documents, these guys were informed by big thinkers and writers, influencers, if you will, from the Enlightenment. And those guys were not talking about knock down drag em fights and red states and blue states and let's, you know, divvy up the country. That, that was not what the founders had in mind. So I think if we hold on to, to the belief and the, the vision that they had, we can continue in the right direction, doing things in a virtuous manner. And this is why I never subscribe to this. Um, yeah, you have to pick a sign. But no, we don't have to draw battle lines, at least not yet, in my opinion. I think that there's always a way to get along with people. If you're trying to be agreeable, I, I understand some people will criticize and say, well, that's the problem. We're too agreeable. Maybe that's your problem. Uh, I don't think that's my problem. And listen, I'm the first one to go at it with people on the phone and anywhere else. I have these debates sometimes on television. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is by and large, your neighbors, the people you work with, the people that you have to deal with on a regular basis. I don't believe it serves us any purpose to get into mean-spirited conversations with them every time we engage with them. I don't see the benefit. I think you get more flies with honey than you do with vinegar, right? I think that's the, the, the saying. So that's my thought on that. I don't know if you agree with me or not, but uh, we're going to get to your calls and more straight ahead. Um, actually, we'll do that now, and then we'll come back and we'll uh, play this clip from... Uh, Mayorkas that I wanted to get to and talk about immigration a little bit. But let's go to, um, let's see, Joni, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, KDKA. Joni, go right ahead. You're on with Rich Valdez. Welcome. I was thinking, uh, I'm sorry, Joni. I can't hear what you're saying. The call is cutting in and out. Let's go to George in Burlington, Vermont, WVMT. George, go right ahead. Yeah, I really like your show, Rich, and I'm glad I found it. Thank you. Uh, I was an old Neil Rogers fan. Do you ever remember him? He was kind no. of a one. Uh, he was a big uh, talker, and then he switched over to shock jock and blew the market away in Miami. Hey, oh, one cool. thing that I, I one thing I'd like to say is it seems like lately you're letting a lot of chronics come in. They call, and every night you hear the same guys. It's, talking and I, I don't think that helps. Are you applying for the call screener job? No, I'm not. I'm just saying I don't think it sounds good. I don't like listing a bunch of chronics every night. Well, that, you could have discussed that with the call screener when you were speaking with him. But thank you for your call, George. Uh, we appreciate it. Big shout out to everybody in WVMT. And uh, we're going to continue with the rest of your calls and more straight ahead. 833-482-5337. 8334 Valdez. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now 8334 Valdez. That's 833 482 5337. 8334 Valdez. That's Valdez with an S. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4VALDES. That's Valdez with an S. All right, America, welcome back. We continue with your calls and more. Uh, 833-482-5337. 833-4VALDES. Uh, let's try Joni in Pittsburgh again on KDKA. Joni, can you hear me? Yes, I think Timothy Scott. Uh, I, I hope, I'm thinking. I don't know yet, but I think I think. I, I'm sorry. Trump you said you him. think Timothy what? Scott. Uh, can you spell that out? I can't really hear you. C O T T. 
I never heard of him. Who is this person? S S S C O T T. Oh, he Tim Scott, for, for, the for, senator for from South Carolina. Yes. Yes. Okay. And well, why do you want Senator Tim Scott? Because um, I think that would make Trump more look more diversive. I think it. He has some opinions and ideas that might help. Like what? Might. All right. Well, you think of that. Uh, you give us a call back when you get that idea. Joni, thank you for the call. Big shout out to KDKA. And um, thank you for sharing your thoughts on who you think President Trump should pick as VP. Uh, I want to continue with uh, the conversation that we were on. And there's um, a clip from Mark Elias. Now, Mark Elias is likely one of the most um, sinister and cunning attorneys out there, right? He was the one that plotted this entire mail-in voting craziness that occurred in 2020. Uh, he's um, a lawyer to Hillary Clinton, um, the, the Russia, Russia, Russia hoax. I mean, he's been at the, the center of all this stuff, Mark Elias. And he was on MSNBC yesterday, the day before, yesterday. And uh, he says that Trump is plotting his next crime, right? He's already blaming uh, Trump of conspiring. And he says it's going to involve subverting the outcome of the election. So this is literally what they blamed uh, Trump for for January 6th. They're already blaming him, that on him again. And the election hasn't even occurred. Listen to this. I mean, I think we need to be very, very... Um, eyes wide open about the moment we're in. We now know, based on the jury verdict in New York, that Donald Trump committed a crime to win the 2016 election. We know, based on reporting and the January 6th commission and, and you know, what's come out in the public sphere in the various indictments, that Donald Trump and a number of people around him appear to have committed crimes to try to undermine and overturn the 2020 election. So as we prepare for 2024, Donald Trump is plotting his next crime. Mm -hmm. We may not know sitting here right now what that crime will be, but we know it will involve subverting the outcome of the election. We know it will involve election interference. We know it will involve um, efforts to prevent the will of the voters from, from, from uh, having its day. Subverting the will of the voters. We even we haven't even had the election yet. They're anticipating a Trump win because they know their guy can't win. And they're already throwing mud on Trump's good name. Now, I know some of you are saying, what do you mean? Good name. The guy's a convicted felon. That's the whole point. They're saying he's guilty of election interference when they're the ones that have had him stuck in court for the last, uh, I don't know, year and a half. What, ever since he's announced that he's running for president. When they knew all along that he'd be running. But once it became official, they made their lawfare official. Absolutely ridiculous. But he says it, and the folks at MSNBC don't call him out. They don't say a word. They don't say a thing. As long as that's the type of media that we have, we're always going to have this, this one-sided echo chamber where people just say what they want. Again, this is why I allow people to call in all the time and disagree with me and give us the other side of the story or even guests that I, I may not agree with, uh, but we'll get what they have to say. This is why we've invited um, all the candidates that were running for president, including RFK Jr., a uh, prominent Democrat and now independent. We've invited him on and hopefully uh, he'll, he'll accept the invitation. But we always try to get that perspective. Yet Mark Elias comes and gives this, this perspective that, in my opinion, is just it's fake, it's phony, and it's fraudulent. And then he's backed up by crooked FBI lawyers that should have been fired, like Andrew McCabe. You know, he was the guy that was uh, working with Peter Strzok and, and, and his girlfriend, Lisa, in subverting the, uh, the presidency, right? I mean, it's just crazy, the things that we see. Now, Andrew McCabe is on CNN, where he, I believe he works. And he says that the Department of Justice, the FBI, all the folks there are worried about being thrown in jail the second 
that Trump is elected to a new term. To that, I would say, good for them. I'm glad they're scared. That means they know they've committed crimes and they know that accountability is a coming. Of course, they're going to try and paint it as we're just the good men and women of the FBI and Trump is mean and he's going to jail us because he's a dictator. He said so himself. Listen to this. I I have a lot of conversations with uh, former colleagues, people who are or were in the intelligence and law enforcement community uh, and may have worked in, you know, the Obama administration, other places. And, you know, people are really trying to assess, like, what is life going to be like if Donald Trump wins a second term? And on a very personal level, I mean, these are torturous discussions with their family members about whether or not they have to leave the country Uh, to avoid being unconstitutionally and illegally detained. I mean, people are actually worried about being thrown in jail or grabbed in some sort of extrajudicial detention. And I think, you know, as crazy as this sounds in the United States of America, I think people should really consider that these are possibilities. Listen to what the man says. He typically does what he says, as crazy as it seems. uh, and, And that's really all the indicators you need. People should really consider that these are possibilities, extrajudicial detainments and whatnot. Now, what what I find interesting here is the only time I've ever seen that be considered was when tyrant governors were trying to put me and anybody else who didn't want to wear a mask or get a vaccination into jail or our own little community because they felt that we were killing grandma and it was blame the unvaccinated for everything. That was the only time that I, I, I ever feared that my government was going to do that to me. I've never felt like that with Donald Trump. I never heard Trump say, if, if you're a Democrat, we're going to put you in jail. Never. Quite the contrary. They, they always blame him for saying he says there's good people on both sides. I've never heard Trump ever threaten lawfare. And, and that's the funny part here. They're the ones literally doing it, and they're blaming it on him. But yet that's their M.O. time and again. So, Andrew McCabe, shame on you. And honestly, you're not as convincing as Adam Schiff. You're not as uh, fear-monger-ish as Mark Elias. I think your presentation was weak. I don't know if you guys believed Andrew McCabe, but he didn't sway me, not one bit. It sounded like a very, very, very weak attempt to try to justify his criminality, his malfeasance, and that of his friends that joined him in doing so. All right, folks, the music means we got to go. We're coming right back with the second half of our number three, Open Phone America. The phone number is 833-482-5337, 833-4VALDEZ. And there is a MAGA drag queen that was doing some man-on-the-street interviews about Hamas and how they treat gays. Listen to this coming up. And he's breaking it down. It's America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. So what do you get when you combine a MAGA drag queen named Lady MAGA and... Her doing interviews or they doing interviews with individuals that are supporting Hamas and then explaining to them that Hamas kills the gays. Oh, it's quite the spectacle. And we're going to get to that audio in just a moment. But I want to get to some of your calls. Uh, Let us go to Walter, St. Augustine, Florida, WFOY. Go right ahead. Hey, Rich. Hasta la próxima est aquí. There, there you go. We are here, sir. How are you tonight? What's going good. on? Good, good. I hope you're okay, too. And thanks for your screener. And the other guy had no right to criticize him. But anyway, the other night you said people will think of their grandpas and feel sorry for Biden. You know, maybe a little bit of um, uh, whatever you call that dementia. dementia or such. Yeah. Yeah. But I thought of that for about 10 seconds, and I did feel sorry for 10 seconds. And then I realized <laughs> our grandpas, Abuelos, was not, you know, crooked Joe Biden. 
Right, right. They're so, not doling uh, billions and billions of dollars to Ukraine. Exactly. That, that's it. It has a proxy war with, uh, going on with Russia. And he immediately started the war games with South Korea, and that ruined Trump's peace with uh, Kim Jong-un. So I just right, thought but, and that's exactly the point that I was making, Walter, is that if we keep it on the issues, right, if we don't talk about Joe uh, and his senility and the fact that he's old and all of that, um, that that's a byproduct of really what we should be talking about, which is the corruption and how badly he does his job. And once you point those things out, then people don't feel bad because they remember this is why I'm angry at him, not because he's, you know, the doting old grandpa, which has always been my point. Uh, but, yes, he's a bumbling idiot. And he was always a bumbling uh, fool, even before he got old like this. You know, I'm, I'm talking about even old school Joe Biden was always, you know, putting his foot in his mouth. He's a gaff machine. <laughs> yeah, Exactly. Thank you so much, Rich, for taking the call again. Oh, you bet, Walter. I appreciate you calling in from St. Augustine, Florida, WFOY. Thank you, sir. And where do we go from here? Let's go to Ovidio. Ovidio's in Claysville, Pennsylvania, listening online, richvaldez.com. Go right ahead. Hey, Rich. Uh, just had a call. Uh, I, I've always been listening to your show for the past few years. I work in the oil and gas industry, and, of course, I'm a big supporter of Donald Trump. I haven't Thank done you. my... Uh, I haven't done uh, uh, that much of uh, research because of work related, you know, as far as who should who should he pick for for vice president. But uh, right. we'll yeah, we'll, we'll see. But more than anything, I just wanted to talk to you and, and commend you and thank you coming from a Mexican. I'm from the Rio Grande Valley from oh, the wow. McAllen, Texas area. And wow. uh, I work. You still in, have family there throughout the nation. Oh, yes. My wife actually lives in the valley. Uh, and what travel, are they telling you uh, is going on? Because I hear it's, you know, it's it's really hot down there. And I don't mean temperature wise. I mean, you know, with the crossings and whatnot. Oh, Lord, Lord. I actually I, I am from a small town that unfortunately, when uh, when the, our, our President Trump uh, ended, our, our his term ended, the border wall just happened to up right there like in a place called Havana, Texas. And it didn't get it it didn't get to our, our town, which it was going to, but it didn't because of all these, you know, crazy lunatics that we have right now. <laughs> the yeah. clown show we have the White House. So yeah, uh it was bad. It was bad. It's still bad. Everything is so bad down there besides the heat. That's that's another point. <laughs> <laughs> that, that that's a given, right? Now let me ask you, you said you work in the oil and gas industry and you're in Pennsylvania, so I'm guessing you guys are fracking and getting liquid natural gas, is that right? Uh well, yeah, uh, the, or is the it oil? liquid uh, the, uh, yeah, no, no, it's gas, natural gas, natural gas. Uh, uh I uh, I, I can't say what company I work for, but but we we uh, kind of like a, a, a compressor stations, uh, uh, yeah. uh, metering stations that that the companies sell to uh, local providers. You Got know, it. like now, let me ask you: Do you whatever. feel uh, yeah. the impact of Biden's policies on your work? Has it slowed down at all? Since uh, since Biden's been in office the last three, almost four years? Yes. Yes. It, it, it has gone down. Actually, I was going to go to a project in Brownsville, Texas, and uh, that got put on hold because of all the LNG exports and stuff. I don't know. I don't know if you heard about I'm pretty sure you did, you know, what they did. So, yes, it's, it's mm -hmm. been taking a toll on it. Believe it or not, but it it, it is. It has been taking a toll on on the oil and gas uh, slowly but surely is, is going to get there. Hopefully not. That's why we need to elect Donald Trump. We, <laughs> now, we, we need him. <laughs> I, I agree with you. Uh, Ovidio, what is your thought on how it plays out in, in November? Do you think uh, Trump is coming in strong? I do. Yes. Yes. Uh, of course. Before I continue all the, all the made up charges that they, that they, have against him oh lord anyway the the the, the supreme court needs to step in you know, we need to do something with something needs yeah. to happen and uh, of course all of this is a distraction of the real good stuff that is going on with hunt by hunter biden that you know that eventually is gonna come back and hunt uh or drive in the president you know <laughs> mm -hmm. 
I get it. Well, thank you, Ovidio. I appreciate it. Very, very astute commentary. And you're on the front lines, both uh, at the border when you're home and on the front of the energy sector and the, the damage that's been done by the Biden administration there. I appreciate you, my brother. Keep up the good work. Gracias por la llamada. And we will talk again soon. Uh, let me see. Where do we go from here? Let's go to. Oh, yes. The drag queens. Uh, I'm going to get to the drag queens momentarily. I just want to get to Leon in Las Cruces, New Mexico. K-O-B-E. Um, go right ahead. It's hot down here. We're, we're you know, 105. Woo. And it's already in the beginning of the season. And uh, my comment is, I, I, I think, uh, um, you know, Biden always does everything for his family. And, we, you know, uh, the... Um, uh, Trump's a convicted felon, and by, and uh, Hunter Biden is going to be a convicted felon. So I think Biden probably thinks that the, that our country would accept Biden as stepping in and being the president. And I think I think that's actually in his mind somewhere is what I think. You know, I, I once heard Hunter Biden say that. He would like to get into politics, and I think he even said he'd like to run for president. And I have to tell you, that was um, interesting. I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of people that want to run for president. But what I found interesting about it was life is so crazy sometimes that you never know what type of sob story, you know, and heartstrings can be pulled to to manipulate a situation. But in this case, I think, you know, anything's possible. Right. He could easily come out and say, look, you guys are considering voting for a guy who's been convicted. Uh, I'm in a, in a courtroom right now on a felony charge. We're not that different. But here's where we are different. Right. And, and I could see him, you know, trying to pull that off. But I just don't think the American people would go for it. I think um, they're they're at the point where. They were with Bush. Right. I think people were saying they had Bush fatigue and they didn't they didn't like Jeb, but they didn't want to vote for Jeb because they were tired of George W. And uh, and tired of his father before him. And I feel like that's where they are with Biden. We've had so much Biden. We've had enough Biden for a few lifetimes. I don't think there's any space for a Hunter Biden presidency. But uh, we'll see if if that does happen. Uh, I'm going to say that Leon in Las Cruces, New Mexico on KOBE called it on D-Day. Thank you, Leon. I appreciate it. Folks, we're coming back. I'm going to play this drag queen audio. It's going to blow you away. Don't go anywhere. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. With Rich Valdez. Call now, 833 4 Valdez. That's 833 482 5337. 833 4 Valdez. That's Valdez with an S. So I did a study abroad in the Middle East with Israel and Palestine. Would you say you're pro Palestine or pro Israel? Pro Palestine. As a gay man, I would be punished and or put in prison or killed if I were openly gay in Palestine. How do you react to that? I didn't know that. So It is illegal to be gay in Palestine. You are punished by is prison or death. Is Israel? No, Israel has gay pride. Okay. Israel is completely open to lesbian and gay people. So Palestine the puts them in prison or kills them. You, were, you weren't aware of that? I was not aware of that, no. So that does pose an interesting aspect. Have you seen uh, the Queers for Palestine movement? It's a, very, it's a very common movement, but I don't see any Muslims for queer movements. Uh, yes. That's where it gets gray, right? Like, that's where I well, feel well, like... Well, for me, it's not gray. I am fearful of Islam because there is no Islamic country on earth that embraces me as a gay man. So, okay, okay, so maybe I'm confused because Israel, which is an, still an Islam country, right? No, 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 Jewish. Okay, 
Okay, okay, okay. So Israel's Jewish, Palestinians are Islamic. Okay. Wow. Now, again, if, if that didn't blow you away, then you, you probably went to school with that lady. But if it did, it's because that was mind-blowing, right? That was absolutely mind-blowing that you have people that don't realize that the same people they're defending would stone them to death, put them in jail, depending on what region of the Middle East they'd be in, right? That's, that's crazy. And speaking of crazy, I've been trying to work on getting a guest, and they're not easy to find. But there was a bunch of years ago, during uh, the Afghanistan conflict, there were a bunch of Americans that did the right thing to protect little kids. There is a practice, I'm forgetting what it's called, uh, but some um, Arabic word. And it's the equivalent of a, a, a vile practice that was practiced in ancient Greece, uh, which was called pederasty. And it was where parents would kind of give their children over, their boys, over to scholars. And these scholars would rape these children and receive sexual favors from these young boys. And that was the form of payment for them to be tutored. And this was a, a commonly accepted practice uh, in, in ancient Greece and also practiced in Afghanistan. And it's... Um, and with different custom and different nuance, right? Where they, they have them do this like twerking type of dance where they shake their bottom and it really is sick stuff. And when the American troops arrived in, in Afghanistan, uh, there was a, a, some special operators that witnessed this stuff. Yeah, I'm talking way back when. And apparently some of the security forces that were under contract by the United States to secure certain areas against the Taliban were engaging in this practice. So American troops were caught between a rock and a hard place where they were like, look, we're here to get rid of the bad guys, the Taliban. But the Taliban wasn't doing this because they're so strict they didn't allow that. They made it totally illegal. And it, it's it, the whole thing is just a very sordid story. But I, I bring that up because... The Middle East is very, very hot, right? It's a hot button uh, region of the world, and um, eventually we're gonna, we're gonna, you know, get a couple of uh, guests that were either there or know a whole lot about exactly what I'm describing to you, um, because I feel like that th these incidents were reported. There was a piece in the New York Times, but they went away, and and nobody really talks about it. And I think one person's under a gag order, and the other person's just hard to get. And hope we're trying to get them uh, scheduling wise. But the point is, too many people don't know about these weird and illicit practices. And, and in the United States, we have entire movements of people in academia that support this, um, what they call intergenerational sex, that think that children should have sex with adults. And we, we've heard about that, the disciples of Alfred Kinsey, Dr. Kinsey, he was one of those wackos that, that believed in that and has a bunch of... Um, uh, kinfolk, I'm going to say, uh, a bunch of protégés that have followed suit with his crazy thinking. And we talked about him a number of times on this program, but I think you can never talk about it enough because he's really like the modern-day godfather of all of the craziness that we're seeing. When, when we have these conversations like this woman saying she supports Palestine, she thinks that Israel's an Islamic country. I mean, the, the, the amount of crazy that was in that clip that we just heard is, again, mind-boggling. And the things that are going on in the Middle East are even more mind-boggling. So we're going to continue with your calls. we got calls from Ohio, Chicago, and Idaho. And we're going to do that straight ahead. Don't go anywhere. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-4. 433 for Valdez. That's Valdez with an S. Voted best. 
best head of hair in live late night radio six years in a row. It's Rich Valdez. All right, America, welcome back. And we go to the middle of the country to check in with John in Lorraine, Ohio. John, what radio station are you listening to tonight? I don't know for sure. It might be W something E. Ah, yeah, you might be getting one of the Jersey signals spilling over into Ohio like W-E-E-U. Anyway, what's on your mind tonight, John? Go right ahead. Well, I think the uh, uh, situation in the Middle East uh, really has nothing to do with uh, 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 putting down the Palestinians for not having a pride pride march. Uh, the, the countries that the United States power structure I supported, the CIA, the Pentagon, and the U.S. government, have been the most uh, uh, undiverse and most right-wing reactionary, whether it is uh, uh, Israel or whether it is the uh, uh, Arab countries have been the, the most uh, uh, right-wing reactionary against uh, women's rights or anything along those lines. And I think this goes back to the United States support for uh, really uh, al-Qaeda and mujahideen terrorists in, the, in Afghanistan and everywhere throughout the Middle East, uh, because they were anti-communist, anti-Soviet, and uh, the fact that they were uh, the most uh, biased against uh, women, I think, is uh, inherent in uh, the, the United States alliance with those right-wing fascist dictatorships and uh, the uh, ethnic uh, supremacy of Israel and the Arab countries like Saudi Arabia. They well, have let me all... ask you a question, John. Uh, with all the countries that you're talking about, would you say they align with the right wing of American politics? Because you keep mentioning right wing, but I can't think of uh, every left winger I know supports all of these um, Middle Eastern countries. No, they don't support those governments. No, they, so I, it, it's the Republican Party that's supporting Palestine. No, or is it every uh, last Democrat? It is the uh, Republicans and the Democrats who have supported. Can you name two dictators. Republicans that are supporting um, Palestine? Uh, two right-wing uh, Republicans that are yeah. supporting a uh, well. Uh, as a matter of fact, the right-wing uh, Republicans are no different from the right-wing Demo- uh, Democrats who dominate both parties and both support. Yeah. Uh, what you're doing right now is called filibustering because you don't have an answer because you can't name two Republicans that are pro-Hamas or pro-Palestine. You just can't. They're not out there. Right. The reality is that the support of the Middle East comes from the left wing. So, I mean, you could sit here and try and tell everybody listening that it's these right wing countries and this right wing this and this right wing that. But the reality is it's not right wing at all. It's not right wing at all. These are these their biggest support structure in the United States comes from the radical left. I think you know that you just don't want to admit it. But thank you for your call, John. I appreciate your America bashing as much as I could take it. (laughs) All right, folks. Hasta la próxima. Take care. Good night. And God bless you, America. I shall return.